Okay. Here we go. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the webinar, Utility Incentive Programs, How to Get More Money Quickly and Easily. My name is Scott Ellis, and I'm a product marketing manager here at Onset. I will give you a brief introduction, and then I'll turn over the presentation to our speaker today. Go ahead if you want to hit the next slide. There we go. Um, so a little bit about uh, Onset Computer first. Um, so for folks who don't know us, we're the company that is the leader uh, in data loggers. Uh, they're used all over the world for building performance monitoring, environmental research, and water monitoring. We've been making data loggers since 1981, and we've sold a bunch of them, over 200, uh, over 2 million so far. We have roughly 120 employees, and we're located here in Massachusetts on beautiful Cape Cod, where we design and assemble all of our products. We have a global network of dealers that serve our entire customers around the world. The webinar is going to run for about an hour. We'll save time for questions uh, at the end, so please feel free to type them into your questions seen in the Go-To Control panel. We are recording the webinar today, and uh, a link will be sent out to this in a follow-up email a few days after the presentation. And finally, please take a minute to complete the short evaluation, which will pop up after you close out of the webinar. So now I'd like to introduce you to Matt Ganser, uh, Director of Engineering at Carbon Lighthouse, an, an energy firm that makes it profitable for commercial and industrial buildings to eliminate their carbon footprint. Since its founding in 2010, Carbon Lighthouse has completed over 100 projects in California and Oregon. Matt is responsible for helping plan and execute energy projects at industrial, commercial, and other facilities. Prior to Carbon Lighthouse, Matt was a, a National Science Foundation Fellow at Stanford University and has served as a drilling engineer for Royal Dutch Shell. Matt holds a Master's in Science from Stanford University and a BS in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Texas. Welcome, Matt. I'll let you take it away. All right. Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction, and good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Um, Carmen Lighthouse is excited to be here, so we thank you for the opportunity. And today we're going to talk about the big impact that we can have in commercial buildings with relatively small effort of understanding temperature better in those buildings. So let's, uh, let's dive into it. So the obligatory buildings in the big Y slide. So in, in buildings, we care about a lot of things. Um, we care about clean energy. We care about our CO2 emissions. We want to reduce our electrical and gas bills. Uh, we want to address maintenance expenses. We care about equipment performance. Comfort is very important to us, and for especially for office buildings, tenant happiness is very important. But prioritizing what to do um, means quickly predicting performance with more certainty. Ultimately, we want to know how to make decisions with less ambiguity, and a big part of this is data, lots of data and data over time. And this is where equipment, this is where equipment and temperature loggers can come in. It allows us to model equipment and systems with a lot more accuracy, and they can be very powerful tools. So the way we're going to talk about this today in the context of buildings is we're going to address why temperature and, to extent, uh, relative humidity are important measurements. We're going to talk a little bit about using loggers. However, I know other, other webinars have covered this, so we'll kind of hit some of the highlights with respect to measuring air and fluid temperatures. Uh, then, we'll, then we're going to jump into applications, a lot of case studies, specifically dealing with comfort, building management systems, and utility saving, and where temperature and relative humidity fit into those. So let's talk, let's talk about temperature uh, so, and, and why it matters. So temperature, if you're in the academic world, it's an expression of internal energy to, I think that's entropy, it's been a while. Um, if you're in engineering, though, and you're more towards the real world, uh, temperature is the driving gradient for your main heat transfer equations of conduction, convection, and radiation. And these are ultimately what really impact how comfortable we are, how equipment operates, how much heating or cooling is required, and ultimately utility costs in the building. So for building 
buildings, temperature is actually in the middle of a lot of these things, um, and relative humidity as well. And it intersects a lot of building applications, and we're going to talk about these three general spheres as we continue along. So starting at the top is building management systems uh, and fault detection. And this is important for your, your service contractor, a facility manager, or building engineer. Um, temperature also has a lot of relationship, obviously, to occupant comfort. And if you're a property manager, a building owner, or a facility manager, keeping your tenants happy is, is pretty important. And finally, both of these have heavy overlap with energy and utility savings, um, often the focus for energy auditors and building engineers. And what's really cool about temperature is that, well, it's pretty easy to measure. Um, we have a very intuitive feeling. If you just lick your finger and you kind of wave it around, you get a sense of how warm or how cold a space is or how, how warm or hot a, a pipe is. Uh, if you want more accuracy, you can take spot measurements with an IR gun, with a thermocouple, with a thermometer, and, and this is much better information. But what's most powerful that, is allow, that allows us to make decisions is quantitative data over time to allow us to see long-term trends. And this is really where data loggers are measuring temperature and rel relative humidity, where it can become pretty powerful. So that's the big why on temperature and relative humidity. Uh, we're going to jump into actually using loggers for the next few slides before jumping into the application. So a caveman couldn't do it, but a reasonably smart person could launch and deploy a logger within two minutes. And once you've done this a few times, you could honestly launch about two to three loggers every minute. Um, so it should not be seen as, you know, this really shouldn't be a barrier for a lot of people. Of course the trick is knowing what to measure and what to do with that information, which is what we're going to cover. So first launching. Um, pretty basic. You just want to make sure you have Hoboware installed. You connect your logger via a micro USB. Uh, all of this comes pretty standard kit. You can typically do this in your office or home, not at the site that you intend to measure uh, information at. And when you want to actually launch it, you click the little icon in the upper left-hand corner, and that gets you to the user interface that you can start programming how and what you want to measure with your logger. So with temperature and relative humidity, um, you can measure air or you can measure fluid. So we'll talk about both real quick. So for air measurements, uh, loggers are pretty good for your outdoor air temperature, return air temperature, supply air, mixed air, zone air temperature. And if you're not familiar with these terms, we'll dive into these a little bit more. When measuring air temperature, you want to pick your temperature and relative humidity sensors um, under the sensors block. Uh, under deployment, this is where it gets a little tricky. Um, for interval or the sampling rate at which you take data, uh, 15 minutes is pretty sufficient for air temperatures. Uh, that's because systems don't usually don't change too rapidly. And if you're taking data over a four to eight week period, you'll usually c catch all of the conditions. So 15 minutes is pretty sufficient. A couple of tips for start logging. Uh, at Carbon Lighthouse, we usually pick a pretty standard date. We do it at the end of a deployment day. So if we're going to be working on site all day, we'll usually pick a time of about 7 p.m. or 8 p.m. That, that evening to start logging at. And we deploy all of our loggers to start recording at the same time. It makes it a little easier for organization later on, later on during analysis. The other thing uh, I definitely recommend doing is naming the logger something recognizable and useful under description. Uh, we used to get a lot of loggers back that said temperature. And when you have 100 loggers that say temperature, it's very difficult to understand later what was what. So a couple of basic tips that will save you a lot of headache down the road. The other temperature we're very curious about measuring in buildings is fluid temperature. Um, and we usually do this in, in fluid that's trapped in pipes. So think of applications like cooling towers, chillers, boilers, the leaving and entering water temperature. Generally, uh, instead of using temperature and relative humidity under sensors, we click on the external temperature probe from the probe list, and then you have an, arranged, you have a, an array of uh, options for the temperature for the external sensor. Just make sure you, you're uh, linked up to the right one. For the sampling rate, or the interval, as Anta calls it, uh, water temperatures also don't change too rapidly. So a logging interval of about 15 minute, minutes will work. If you're doing a very, um, if you're, if you're doing a project that involves a lot of valves opening and closing and you're really curious how something is sequenced, then one minute may be a better call. And we do that sometimes for uh, some of our more, 
more advanced projects. Uh, same tips as before, an additional one for fluid and pipes is using some sort of cheap insulative material uh, to cover your external temperature sensor, and then you can use duct tape or a pipe clamp to secure it. This gives you a much more accurate reading uh, of the temperature of the fluid inside the pipe. It, it's never going to be exact. It's usually going to be a little warmer because of the ambient temperature in the room or the equipment space, but that insulation gives you a little bit more security that you're getting, getting a better measurement. All right, so we've launched our loggers. Now we're putting them in the field. Uh, basically, it's pretty easy. Uh, you can put them, as far as attachment is concerned, most loggers have a magnetic backing. This means you can stick them to a piece of angle iron, a pipe, a diffuser, a door frame. Uh, you can use duct tape. Uh, and, and really just want to think about what's a secure kind of out of the way spot. Uh, as far as actually making sure you get your loggers back, uh, it's a lot of valuable information. Usually just ask your the staff of the building, the security personnel, or the tenants not to move them. Let them know that they're taking place in a cutting edge energy study. Um, <laughs> and uh, you don't want them to affect the data. So we've got loggers deployed. We have them placed in the field. And after, a four, after anywhere between a one to six week sampling period, uh, it's time to download and take a look. Uh, so at this point, we connect the logger, again, via micro USB. Uh, we just click readout, which is located in the upper left-hand side of your, uh, of your Hobo, HoboWare. You can analyze the data either in the HoboWare window, as shown here, or you can download a CSC file to do your own custom modeling or, uh, or software. Uh, a couple of tips, which are, you know, we, even, we forget even here, which is, you want to note when you actually picked up your logger, the date and the time. I have had many logger measurements logging the temperature of the truck, the trunk of my rental car. Uh, you don't want that to throw you off. You want to make sure you filter that out, information out later. And when diving into the analytics or, or graphs, as they used to be known, you want to think about, you don't want to be fooled by it. You want to generally think about when was the equipment actually running? When was the building open? How does occupancy impact my measurements? And what am I trying to look for? What am I trying to prove before you really dive into the data? Because when you have 50 to 100 loggers, it can be pretty overwhelming. So have some sort of working hypothesis before you get started. OK, uh, we've covered why temperature is important and using them. Uh, the rest of the time, we're going to talk about these three general areas where uh, temperature and relative humidity are applicable, starting with perhaps the most important and immediate Comfort. So comfort matters to everyone, but especially property managers and facility managers. And that's because tenants represent a lot of rent, hence net operating income. Comfort is a fairly large zone. Uh, we're pretty adaptable as humans, but outside of it, it seems like we, we as people, we quickly notice it. We notice if we're too hot, too cold, uh, too dry, too humid. Um, the other thing that's interesting about comfort is that your central systems, or your central plant information, or your BMS may not give you the whole story of what's going on at the zone level, especially when you don't have temperature sensors measuring discharge air temperature or different VAV zones. The other thing that's interesting about comfort is that we often find that it's a symptom of something else that might be going wrong in the system. So if the space is especially hot or cold, that might be an indicator that there's something wrong with a BMS, there's something wrong with equipment. And all of that can translate to unnecessary maintenance and utility costs. So let's take a look at a couple of examples here. Starting with zone air. So zone air is another way of thinking about uh, the set point of a room. And so let's, uh, let's start simply with a San Francisco Bay Area gym building. A uh, pretty basic system. It's a constant air volume system serving uh, several zones, but they're all in the same, uh, all in the same air handler. There's no cooling, but there were supposedly functioning economizers in this point. And if you don't know what an economizer is, we'll, we'll hit it at the end. And generally, the property manager was hearing, it, is the room hot? They were hearing some complaints that it seemed like it was warm and people were a little bit upset. But the property manager wasn't sure if this was real or not, and is there something that you know they should do or, or could do. So in this particular circumstance, we put temperature and relative humidity loggers on the roof and in the zone space, uh, measuring outdoor air temperature and the zone air temperature as well. 
The logger here is shown next to the return grill uh, in the space. We put several of these out so we can get several measurements. Pretty easy to deploy, as you can see, and that's secured in place by a magnetic backing. We logged data for about a month at a 15-minute interval. And the results are, are pretty interesting. So this is a correlation between zone air and outdoor air during filtered for operating hours in this particular space. The blue, the bluish gray area gives an indication of what's considered normal. And as what you can see is that the return air temperature or the space temperature is actually outside of the normal range for most of the outdoor air temperature regime that was measured. Now what this means is, well first, that that it was definitely an issue. This, when it's 70 degrees outside, it should not be 80 to 85 degrees in a space. That's just a little bit too warm for most people's comfort. Um, so the complaints were justified, which was good quantitative information for that property manager to know. And when taking this analysis further and actually doing an analysis of the economizers, we learned that although there was no cooling in the system, we did discover that the economizers were failing to bring in cooler outdoor air when they could. Um, the dampers were actually shut, so the system was essentially recirculating pretty much 100% return air, um, thus creating the uncomfortable zone. All right, so we talked about uh, zone air. Let's talk about discharge air, another case study. So discharge air is it's the temperature that's coming out of your diffusers. Those are the grills that are in the ceiling or sometimes even the floor of different spaces. And typically, uh, discharge air temperature is, is, if you're trying to cool a building, the temperature is significantly cooler than the set point of the room, and vice versa when you're heating. So this is a pretty typical uh, office building, fairly modern one, I think uh, early 90s vintage. It was a little bit more of a complicated system, what's called a variable air volume system, with reheat on the various VAV boxes throughout the space. The facility manager uh, thought that the return air temperature, that's kind of the average of all the zone air temperatures, seemed normalish, but maybe a little bit high on the central BMS information. But the property manager was getting reports that people felt pretty stuffy and frankly uncomfortable. So we deployed loggers measuring return air temperature, outdoor air temperature, and discharge air temperature throughout the building. And as you can see, this is a discharge air temperature grill here, just again using magnetic backing to get an indication of, of the temperature from the diffuser. After taking data for about five weeks uh, with about 30 loggers, we came up with a lot of interesting information. So starting on the left-hand side, this is a correlation between return air and outdoor air filter for operating hours. So as you can see, the space actually was warm, but it wasn't too warm. The BMS return temperature sensor was reading correctly and accurately. So as far as the facility manager was concerned, everything seemed kind of okay on his end. However, the, the central information failed to capture what was going on within all the different zones. And it turned out about a third of the VAV box uh, reheat valves were broken or damaged. And, what, and the result is that the discharge air temperature from a lot of these diffusers is significantly higher than what's considered normal. So taken between the 80 and 90 degree air temperature ranges, as far as outdoor air temperature range, the diffusers were discharging temperatures that were at minimum in the high 60s to upward. Some of them were actually about 110 degrees. This is a few select ones. And so this, this was, again, great information that wasn't available in the central and plant location, but could only be obtained cheaply and affordably with data loggers. Um, and the building is still considering how to best how best to proceed. But recognizing this and understanding this was a big key to, to making some decisions. The last comfort uh, case site I'd like to look at deals with relative humidity. So this took place in a weight room uh, and that also had a few other high active areas in it. Um, I think some aerobics or jazzercise like classes. The facility manager reported that they knew that there were severe comfort issues, but they weren't sure if it was a lack of outdoor ventilation, ventilation in general, cooling capacity, or, or something else. The property manager reported that there were a lot of complaints about just general stickiness on walls and equipment. So clearly everybody aware, is aware that something's happening, uh, but they want to get a better handle of exactly what is happening and what they can do about it. 
So loggers to the rescue again. So we measured zone air temperatures and relative humidity uh, throughout the building. In this particular case, we also measured CO2 levels. So taking a look at this graph, um, in orange, you can see that the CO2 levels, well, they, they're kind of diurnal. So when people are there in the space, there's more CO2. When people are out of the space, there's less CO2. And the fact that a lot of the levels are elevated above 1,000 parts per million is, as that's usually the code limit in most places, um, indicates that there is indeed some sort of ventilation problem. We're probably not getting enough outdoor air in. When combined with the relative humidity information shown in blue, uh, it's very clear that the space is simply underserved. So the relative humidity in this, in this particular uh, building fluctuated from between the 60s and 70s, or even a little above, uh, throughout most of the measurement period. And a 60 to 70 percent uh, humidity ratio with, with temperatures in the 80s is quantifiably hot and sticky. Um, the solution in this particular circumstance uh, and studied was increasing ventilation and bringing on more cooling capacity to frankly bring the room within more tolerable levels. So those are a few different uh, instances where temperature and relative humidity were important for comfort. We're going to switch into thinking about temperature and relative humidity in terms of uh, building management systems. So specifically within building management systems, I want us to think about fault detection and, and why it's important. So building engineers, facility managers, and contractors all really care about this. A, Building management system or automation system or sometimes known as energy management system, they're all really cool pieces of kit that control your building, often using temperature points to make control decisions uh, about how equipment should operate. But a slight problem that comes up or comes up often is that faulty or disconnected sensors may not trigger an alarm. Uh, if a sensor is reading 60 when it, the true value should actually be 80, the BMS isn't smart enough to detect that issue. And poorly controlled equipment that's using incorrect inputs can lead to comfort issues for one, uh, unnecessary equipment <clears throat> wear for two, and, but, and furthermore, unnecessary expensive utility costs. Let's talk about this a little bit with a couple of examples. Starting with a hot water loop. Um, so this is a case of a community center. It's a pretty modern one, early to mid-2000s, uh, pretty new BMS as well. I've seen a couple upgrades. The facility manager reported that there, hadn't, there weren't any temperature complaints in any of the zones, so it didn't seem like there was an issue there. Um, when we looked through the BMS, the boiler was enabled. However, the, the pump and boiler themselves were both reported on the BMS screen as being off. Speaking with the contractor, the contractor related that he focuses mostly on preventative maintenance and doesn't do a lot of diagnostic work. So it doesn't seem at a very first cursory glance, like there might be anything wrong here. But looking through the BMS a little further, a couple things stood out, and that's the outside air temperature was reading about 67 degrees, when in fact the outdoor air temperature was in the 80s that day. And the second thing that stood out to us is despite the really warm temperature outside, the uh, leaving water temperature from the boiler was reading nearly 180 degrees. And whereas that's not too out of normal, the system was running normally, that is really warm for a system that has supposedly been off for days and days. Even with great insulation, there's just going to be some minor losses that occur, and the temperature should, would really uh, recede maybe into the 100 to 120 range. So we launched loggers. We measured outdoor air temperature, and we put external temperature sensors on the leaving and entering water side of the boiler, measuring at about 15-minute sampling rate. We also deployed a current transducer plus a hobo on the pump disconnect. And then we overlap the data and, and look for uh, what might be happening. And what we found is that the logic was actually correct in the BMS. So they did have this outdoor air temperature sensor. They had an outdoor air temperature lockout. There's a high limit. So as soon as you crossed about a 75 degree threshold, the boiler and the boiler pump should shut off. But poor relay wiring and faulty temperature sensors failed to disable the hot water system. And you can see that on the graph on the right hand side here. This is simply the current plotted against the outdoor air temperature. And despite a large range of outdoor air temperature regimes that saw above 70 and actually above 90 degrees, the pump ran pretty steadily the entire time without shutting off. 
there is some modulation in the amperage and that's some valve opening and closing. Um, but all to, taken all together, there are heat losses throughout the building that somehow aren't being accounted for. And there's certainly the, the utility cost of just running the pump unnecessarily. Both things that we weren't able to detect purely from the BMS, but we were able to figure out on site with loggers. Okay, jumping into another fault detection uh, case study. Uh, this is a little bit more complicated, so I'll explain it a little bit more. So this had to do with a hot deck reset. So a air handler unit, one configuration is a hot deck and cold deck configuration. And what this is is that there is a hot deck, a, a supply duct that provides really hot air. There is a cold deck that supplies really cold air, and these two air streams are mixed and then discharged to the space collectively. And what's really great about a hot deck, cold deck system is that you can have a very responsive building. You always have hot deck, you always have warm air available, you always have cool air available. You can have very kind of custom, you can very customize your space, you can customize your spaces. The problem with this hot deck, cold deck configurations is they can use a lot more energy if they're not well controlled, and that was the case here. So the building engineer reported that the hot deck seemed to be running at warm outdoor air temperatures. Uh, nothing too unusual, but he was concerned that there might be something weird going on there, um, just purely off of the BMS. The property manager related that, well, there really were no more complaints than usual. Uh, there didn't seem to be a problem. So we decided to check it out. We logged the supply air at temperature on both the hot deck and cold deck at 15 minute intervals for about six weeks. And as you, should, as you can see in the graph on the right, we put them basically immediately after both of the, uh, the heating and cooling coils respectively. So this, we're gonna dive into this a little bit. Um, it was a pretty interesting uh, fault detection. So let's start looking at the graph on the right hand side, starting with the set of uh, data on the bottom of the screen. So this is the cold deck supply air temperature. The yellow line shows the ideal or the, the programmed uh, supply air temperature uh, set point for the BMS, uh, for the cold deck. The blue dots show what it actually is, and as you can see, it's pretty right on the money. So the system was, was following, it, following the program as designed. But the hot deck, something weird was going on there. Um, so the gray line shows what the program was for the, the set points for the hot deck supplier to follow. Yet the actual data we got back from the loggers showed that the hot deck supplier temperatures were significantly warmer than the recommended reset uh, algorithm uh, by quite a bit. So there's a real question of what's going on here. In fact, the hot deck temperature was actually getting warmer the hotter it got outside. When we dove into this a little bit more into the BMS, we realized there was a bit of a logic error. So all the temperature sensors are reading correctly from the BMS, but the hot deck supply air temperature input, instead of using outside air temperature to dictate what the set point should be, it was accidentally linked to the supply air temperature from the cold deck. So as the cold deck supply air temperature was resetting and getting colder, the hotter it got outside, the hot deck was doing exactly the opposite in supplying warmer and hotter and hotter air. And what was interesting about this is nobody really knew this was going on because the space was comfortable and the bills seemed, well, normal. But this minor logic error uh, resulted in significantly higher gas bills than were necessary. Um, and not only and not only that, but once we adjusted this, this, the tenants noticed that it's suddenly, hey, it's a little bit cooler in here. It's a little bit more comfortable. So the building got a win-win with happier tenants as well as lower utility bills. All right, we've talked about comfort. We've talked about BMS. As you can see, there's a lot of overlap between these subjects, uh, but temperature is a big constant between them. The last one we'll dive into is utility saving applications. And we'll focus on kind of the classic example of an economizer. Uh, utility savings aren't, it's, it's not a unique subject, both the other two things relate to it, but utility savings are great because everybody wins, and it especially matters to building engineers and, and energy audit, auditors. So utility costs, they, they impact our net operating income, and increasingly a lot of people are seeing the link between if I lower my utility bill, I also lower my environmental impact. Uh, that's becoming a big sustainability theme. 
And the reason is, this is the one plug for uh, a better energy economy on the right-hand side, is we use a lot of oil, natural gas, we use a lot of coal. And as a former, uh, former engineer who used to drill and frack gas wells for a living, I absolutely understand why they exist and, and why they've been here for so long. But what's really neat is on the energy efficiency side of things and using measurements like temperature, we can address this growing problem by simply reducing demand for these systems, reducing demand for these fuels. So in the end, we can reduce cost, we can reduce environmental impact, and everybody looks good in the process. So let's talk about the classic economizer example. So this is a pretty, um, if, I guess I'll explain a little bit about economizers. Uh, economizers are a, a system of dampers that regulate the fraction of return air to outdoor air going into your mixed air plenum. And this is important because what you want to do is using these dampers to control that ratio, you want to optimize what the ideal, you want to optimize the mixed air temperature such that there is as little a temperature difference as possible between the mixed air and supply air, hence the need for less cooling and less heating. So economizers can play a, a really big role in essentially giving you free cooling. So in this particular circumstance, this is a community center in Sacramento, California. It's a relatively small air handler that serves multiple zones. It's outfitted with a chilled water uh, coil, with chilled water coil, as well as an economizer. And the building reported that they hadn't had any complaints from the occupants. The spaces seemed um, fine. They seemed like they were meeting their set point. So we deployed, as usual, our loggers in mixed air, return air, outdoor air plenum to see what we can see. Shown here on the right-hand side, this is us deploying a, a uh, temperature logger in the mixed air plenum uh, just after, just before the mix, just before the uh, uh, filter bank. And the information we got back was really interesting. So we'll take a second to to talk about the graph on the right before we kind of dive into that what it told us. Um, so generally speaking, uh, there's, a diff there's several different ways to analyze economizers. One way to do it, it is, as shown here, is correlating mixed air and return air temperature against outdoor air temperature, of course filtering for, filtering for operating hours. In an ideal economizer, what you see is a mixed air, a mixed air temperature following an outdoor air temperature until about 70 or 75 degrees, giving you the cooler outdoor air. And then at about that 70 to 75 degree mark, you typically see the mixed air temperature kink and start to follow the return air temperature uh, trend, as you see there. The idea being that why cool 90 degree mixed air temperature, 90 degree mixed air, when you can just cool 70 degree air? You're basically reusing the already cooled air. <clears throat> so we, after recording these measurements, it was pretty clear that it's just the system simply wasn't working. Uh, the mixed air, mixed air trend was following the outdoor air trend, as shown in the yellow dotted line, pretty closely, meaning that without even looking at the dampers, we know they're locked at about 90 to 100 percent, just because of the fidelity with the outdoor air temperature line. By tweaking this, by fixing the motors, by fixing the dampers, and allowing the mixed air temperatures to be controlled and follow the return air temperature line of those warmer uh, outdoor air temperature regimes, we're able to save the we're able to save this particular client an extra twenty four hundred dollars per year. And of course, in other systems, this would scale bigger with uh, larger systems and more systems. So this is a great win in that the, this particular client saved money. Um, we also had reduced environmental impact, but at the same time, nobody knew the, the problem was even occurring to begin with. Temperature logging was really key to, to dive into the bottom of this. Okay, and with that, we're going to open it up a little bit. Um, hopefully what you got from this is, is data allows us to make a lot of better decisions faster. Rather than simply waving our hands around or getting a random spot check measurement with a temp gun, uh, if we get data over time, it gives us a much better picture of what's happening. Also, as you saw at the beginning, loggers are pretty easy to use. Uh, you can buy them and you just start playing around with them and it's just click and play. It just sort of starts working for you. So don't be intimidated uh, by, the, by the devices. They're easier to use than a garage door opener. And as we've, as we've shown here, there's a lot of applications for temperature and relative humidity logging in buildings. 
whether it's BMS, whether it's in fault detection, comfort, utility savings, or a combination of all of those, which is usually the case, temperature is a great starting point for a more intensive energy analysis. With that, I'll say thanks and uh, tell you guys to go measure stuff. Oh, fantastic, Matt. Uh, thank you. And uh, we'd like to open it up to a couple questions that we have out here. And uh, I was just browsing these real quickly. And one of the questions that I had, too, as I was looking at this, uh, you had some really great graphs up there um, that, that obviously the, the Hoboware software, um, you know, can't create. So what did you use to, to analyze that data? Sure. Um, at a very basic level, you can use Excel. Um, there's, you can filter the data uh, with pivot tables. That's a great way to do it. There are some pretty neat tools that are generally available for the public as well, such as the Universal Translator, or UT3, from the Pacific Energy Center. Um, really cool tool that actually works really great with hobos. Um, for us as a company, we've developed our own software over time that processes a lot of CSV files. Um, and I know other companies have the same thing as well. Very basically, though, Excel is a great starting point for any of this. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's see here. Um, I'll just answer, I'll start going down kind of the list here. Um, one question is, for fluid measurements, do you just attach the sensor to the pipe exterior? Um, the answer is yes. Um, if you do have, <clears throat> it's not a perfect measurement, but by adding pipe insulation around, and what I mean by pipe insulation is the simple poly stuff you can buy from a hardware store, and then using a duct tape or a pipe clamp to secure that temperature sensor to the pipe, you can actually get a really good measurement. Um, we've done some comparisons between doing the external of the pipe versus the actual temperature, and it can be, and it's pretty close, within a degree or two which for most HVAC analysis applications is, is very sufficient. Um, let's see here, a couple other, let's see some more questions. Um, for how did you do that last graph, indoor versus outdoor air temperature? <clears throat> Great question. Um, anytime you go to a, a building, um, you should kind of even as a matter of course, is you launch an outdoor air temperature sensor. Because ultimately what you're interested in is how is the building used over what sort of outdoor air temperature regimes or ambient conditions. And simply measuring discharge air temperature without some sort of other information to correlate against um, isn't the most helpful information. So to get that information, we just launched a second logger on the roof. Um, if you don't have another logger, another option is you can download data from NREL. You can also download NOAA weather data. Just make sure it's the quality controlled version. Um, let's see, a couple of great questions. Do you know whether high CO2 levels uh, feel uncomfortable to people in any way? Uh, great question. It's from Ann. I, yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, normally, high CO2 levels are detectable because it's humid and warm in a space. And it's not a perfect correlation, but basically if the same air has been circulated over and over again, the relative humidity in the space has been growing, and the temperature in the space might also be growing. But we can't smell or taste CO2 levels, and I'm sure the concentrations where it starts to affect us are, are pretty darn high. So um, it's, CO2 is a really cool one to measure. Um, you can measure it actually with Hobo's uh, loggers as well. Uh, you just have a real quick uh, kind of caveat around measuring CO2 levels is you want to make sure that when you're measuring CO2 that you account for the periods of time where the economizers are operating because that might, um, that might throw off your data. Uh, because suddenly if you bring in 100% outdoor air, if you're using CO2 as a proxy for occupancy or something like that, um, or using it to do some sort of demand controlled ventilation later, measure later on down the road, you're just going to want to filter out for the periods of time where you're doing a lot of economizing and bringing, up, bringing in outdoor air. 
Um, have you done any setups where the loggers send data to you over the web, or you just always return to get the loggers? Um, so we've done it both ways. So you can get data remotely. I think for Hobo uh, or for Onset, they have a, something called a U30, which you can connect loggers to and then wirelessly transmit the data. Um, as a company, we generally just return the site because the site visits are really crucial as part of our energy auditing process. Uh, we spend a lot of time with boots on the ground understanding the site. There are other companies out there as well that do cellular type transmission where you can get data remotely. However, getting temperature and relative humidity remotely is proving to be a little tricky with some of the cellular applications, especially because if you put a, a sensor inside of a big steel box, it can be really difficult to get um, information from it. Let's see, great question. Um, oh, this is a great one from David Wiley. Uh, for logging inside air handlers like you showed, do you recommend using multiple loggers and averaging, especially in a mixed air plenum where the temperatures could be a lot different in different locations? Uh, the answer is yes. So it depends, of course. This is a great question. Uh, really, really intuitive. Um, what, what David's also referring to here is the stratification that can occur um, in the mixed air plenum. So if you have two air streams coming into your mixed air plenum, a return air and an outdoor air, they may not actually mix very well. Um, they might actually kind of stay in their separate areas within the mixed air plenum. Um, this is especially problematic in big kind of built up air handlers. Uh, whenever we, whenever we work in a big air handler, in, or like in, like one that's built in a building, or an air handler that's just frankly really large, uh, we'll usually put out two, three, or even four mixed air temperature sensors. Um, and as far as being able to predict ahead of time when it's going to be problematic or not, uh, we don't have a really good rule of thumb for that. Sometimes, even in areas where we thought stratification would be a real problem, the logger, the mixed air temperatures came back really close to one another. Other times where we thought mixing would, there would be a lot of mixing, the temperature, the mixed air temperatures could be separate by five or 10 degrees, which is, which is pretty incredible and could really throw off your economizer analysis. So definitely use, feel free to use lots and use many and use often uh, when it comes to mixed air plenum. Um, question about the $2,400 in energy costs in the fitness center example compared to what percent savings? Um, that was just the pure off the, uh, off the top of the energy bill. So that measure alone saves about $2,400 a year. Um, so I, I don't remember what the exact utility bill was for that project, but instead of being a $100,000 bill, the bill is now uh, $97,600. Um, great question from Casey about where does one put the outdoor air temperature sensor to protect it from the weather. So Hobo does sell an, a weatherized outdoor air temperature sensor. We've used those. Um, another thing you can do is you can simply place the outdoor air temperature sensor um, kind of in a protected spot. Uh, roofs are usually rife with equipment, uh, disconnects and that sort of thing that you can use the magnetic and kind of hide it. And another application is you could put a put the hobo in a little plastic baggie, mm -hmm. but beware, that will make your relative humidity measurements inaccurate. Um, and then finally, like I mentioned before, is you can get NOAA quality control data or NREL data, TMY data as another source. And uh, just to, to add on to that, Matt, there, um, I know a lot of people just use simple, um, you know, sandwich containers and, and things like that, but again, you have to watch out, uh, you know, for the, the relative humidity readings, but on the temperature side, that, that works pretty well. Yeah. Actually, we've run into a, a greenhouse, ga greenhouse gas effect as well. Huh. Um, greenhouse warming effect, sorry. Uh, okay. With, with a little box before, we put it directly in the sun, and uh, temperatures came back yeah, in the 130s range, which was pretty surprising for the Bay Area. Okay. Uh, so just be careful not putting them in the sun. So um, you've got to find a, a shaded area when when you put it in a baggie or, or some sort of container, correct? Yeah, correct. Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right, got a question from uh, Phil Jordan here about sensor placement being so crucial 
And can you talk about how you were able to get the hobo situated in the cold deck, hot deck example? Um, so in that particular uh, situation, it's a matter of you have to go to the roof. Um, usually it helps to work with the facility manager, the building engineer there, and you figure out where are the supply decks. Not an easy exercise. I've been on a lot of roofs, and I sometimes I have to always think, what's supply and what's return? Um, we placed the hobos um, directly in the airstream from the supplier, and unlike unlike mixed air, the supplier temperature profile is not going to see a lot of stratification. So one, maybe two at the most, is what's required. So this is simply putting it in the uh, downstream of the cooling and heating coils, respectively. Um, as far as what's going on, the economizer case study example. Um, and just putting uh, op putting placing loggers in ducts work uh, generally. Uh, for us, we use we, it's called a nifty nabber. You get it from Home Depot for like twenty bucks. Uh, as much as possible, we shut off equipment before we enter it. Um, if we can't shut off equipment, or even if we do shut off equipment, we use this little nifty nabber. It's an extension arm to place a lot of loggers for us. Uh, it's just a matter of safety. Um, even though energy efficiency and energy auditing may not be seen as high risk activities. Uh, there's just frankly a lot of hazards on site from the simple like dust, uh, trip slips and falls to arc blasts. So this is yet just another barrier we use to try to prevent ourselves from getting caught in uh, small places. Um, as far as putting loggers in plenums, um, you can often, often stuff them in like filter banks. Um, you can also Awesome. The, excuse me. You can often uh, use the magnetic backing to put the logger on the door of the uh, of the mixed air of the mixed air supplier plenum that you've actually just opened up. Um, the only places you really want to be especially careful is you don't want your loggers to get sucked away. <laughs> so you should think about if the supply fan is on, is that going to draw enough draft to actually pull my logger in? Um, I don't think we've lost any loggers that way at Carbon Lighthouse, but if so, I'd love to see the remains. Um, let's see, we want to measure the floor temperature. How is the best way to do that? That's a great question. Um, if, if this is a question about um, a, just the, the floor temperature, like a concrete floor, uh, the way I would do that is I'd get an external temperature sensor. Um, I would then take that external temperature sensor and put some insulation over it and secure it to the floor. And you'll get a pretty accurate measurement. Um, another way to do it is this could be a simple spot measurement. It depends what your application is. But if you just want to know how hot or how cold the floor is, um, and you don't really need to know over time, you could take an IR gun and perform that. Um, question here about can you describe the device set up in the hot water loop example where CT and HOBO were used to measure current? Sure. Um, so that wasn't covered uh, much in this presentation. I, I called it equipment logging. But HOBO sells um, current transducers as an external attachment to their U12s or a few other loggers as well. An external, the, the, the external uh, device, it's the current transducer, is a simple little clamp-on device that you can put around one of the phases of your pump. So a pump will usually have three phases going to it, three electrical phases. You just want to clamp onto one of them. And it can give you, I think it's the eddy current effect, you can get the um, amperage of that particular phase. Um, so for that particular example, we were concerned that the hot water loop was running when it was 95 degrees outside, which actually turned out to be the case. So in addition to measuring the entering and leaving water temperatures of the boiler, we also wanted to know if the pump was running. So we also measured that as well. Um, let's see here. Other than using individual loggers, any suggestions as to how to inexpensively monitor temperatures in parallel in a large numbers of rooms in a high school? Oh, interesting question. Um, yeah, that's a great question. So I guess there's two things I'll say. Um, one is that if this is a question about being intimidated by using a lot of loggers, uh, don't be. They're pretty easy to use, deploy, and, and download. Um, if this is a question about more on cost, 
uh, there's a couple of things you could do. Uh, one is you could possibly rent loggers. So in California, for instance, you can rent loggers um, from a couple different uh, energy centers. Uh, you can rent them for free as long as you're a rate payer. So that option may be available in your utility area. Um, monitoring temperatures in a large number of rooms, you could also do it, although it wouldn't be in parallel, if you had a series of, if you had kind of a month-long period where the temperature was kind of, the outdoor air temperature was kind of the same, what you could do is you could leave one outdoor air temperature sensor on the roof, and then you could kind of bounce one or two hobos across all of your rooms, measure, measuring only like two or three days at a time. Um, in the end, you do a correlation of your outdoor air temperature against your room air temperature for all of the spaces. The impact might be that you only have you know, 40 or 50 data points per room. Um, and the other, the other risk is that you don't have a very large air, outdoor air temperature regime to work, work over. But if, you have that, if you're comparing apples to apples and doing, comparing everything against outdoor air temperature, it'll probably give you that trend you're looking for. Um, to validate results, are data observations reliable to derive conclusions? Uh, from Hector. Uh, great question. Um, yeah, the answer is, well, <laughs> uh, it depends. Um, and how accurate do you want your results to be? How conservative do you want them to be? Uh, so for Carbon Lighthouse, we use a, we're a very data-heavy organization. Uh, typically, a lot of energy audits are, you know, it's kind of more of a walkthrough and spot measurement. Um, for us, a big step up is we take uh, a few million data points on a typical building. We collect a lot of data. And it just gives us much more accurate models to work with. Um, we actually go back to site later on in our projects to validate and ensure that the savings that we predicted from our projects are happening. And we attribute a lot of this just to having a, an awful lot of data to be reliant upon. Um, that said, you don't want to get tricked by your data, uh, which is easy. <laughs> it's easy to get kind of overwhelmed. Um, and you always want to make sure that what you're seeing in your data makes sense with what the actual systems are on the ground. So the answer is using a lot of data is a lot more powerful than kind of the good old fashioned way of estimating. Um, but uh, more data is better and you have to also know what you're doing um, in order to really make sure your results make sense. Um, as far as, will you please share again the name of the energy group that you use for graphs? Um, as a company, we use our own uh, software, um, but other options that are available out there could be the Pacific Energy Center. You have the Universal Translator tool available. Um, I haven't downloaded the latest version, but I hear it's really cool. Um, it's a way to organize and line up a lot, of, a lot of data pretty quickly, and you can do basic economizer examples or time series uh, correlations pretty quickly. Um, all right, next question from Brad. How are the HOBO relative humidity percent sensors more robust than BMS relative humidity percent sensors? Do they require periodic calibration as BMS sensors do? Um, the answer is yes. Um, as a company, we're also hesitant on the older, our old, the older our loggers are, the more concerned we are do the relative humidity sensors work. And I think where you're going with this, Brad, is that um, enthalpy sensors in, in, a, in an air handler unit can really be finicky. Um, actually, the latest energy codes that are coming out in, I think, Title 24 in California are progressively recommending the use of purely outdoor air temperature and not enthalpy as a way to control economizers, specifically because of this concern. Um, for critical examples, we'll put a couple of relative humidity measurements in a, in a space to try to correlate the two. Usually they're within a couple percent of each other, but if there's a really wide variety, uh, we might go back with additional measurements. Um, overall, just more sensors are better. And just to, to jump in there uh, real quickly on the, on the hobos themselves, um, mo most of the products do have a, a user replaceable uh, relative humidity sensor. And so, you know, typically, um, you know, they drift under 1% per year, depending upon, you know, the environment that they're in. So if there's concerns, you know, that, that some may be looking at a range and it might be, you know, three, four years um, 
that, that you've had the products, there, there are replacement sensors that are available and you can just get them and basically uh, pop them right in and uh, you know that essentially um, starts you from square one again with a brand new RH sensor. Cool. I didn't know that. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yeah. um, so it looks it looks like we're coming up uh, on the on the end of the hour here. I don't know if you want to if there's any more questions you want to take here. If you want to grab. I, I, think we, I think we covered most of the. Okay. Some other cool stuff that people have. I think are these questions available for everybody? Um, yeah, we can make them available uh, afterwards because I do know that there's a couple that we we definitely didn't touch on here. Actually, if you want to click the slide over to uh, your contact information, um, okay. just so if you know people want to get in touch with you or in touch with us. Um, but yeah, this was fantastic. Thank you very much for your time. It was very informative. Cool. Thank you. It's fun to be here. And uh, I guess with that, we'll go ahead and, and wrap this up, and everybody can expect uh, uh, there'll be a follow-on email um, with you know some of these questions uh, potentially answered in a little more detail, and uh, also um, we'll have a link to the recorded session. So thank you again, everybody, and thank you, Matt. Thank you. All right, take All right. care. All right, bye-bye.